And again, I, I feel like I straddle this line, at least I try to, where I try to see both sides because both are necessary. In order for, for there to be pet reptiles, there needs to be both breeders and there needs to be pet keepers. There needs to be both. And they aren't the same. And I think that we need to not demonize breeders. Absolutely, I'll expand it even more and say it's the most underrated reptile in the hobby. And not lizard, snake, you know, no clarifier. I think they're, they're just amazing because they're smaller than a bearded dragon. They're smaller than a blue tongue skank. They're day active, they're bold, they're brightly colored. They are hardier than a bearded dragon or a blue tongue skink. They come from Europe. They experience strong seasonal variation. They can take 100 degrees Fahrenheit and they can take 35 degrees Fahrenheit. They're smart. You know, they're like a monitor or a tegu in terms of intelligence. I target train. the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin and thank you so much for tuning in today. If you're new to the show, then welcome. If you are a regular listener, then thank you so much for your continued support. Today I'm speaking with Frank Payne. You may have seen his Instagram or YouTube channel, Living Art by Frank Payne. He is an incredible keeper and breeder. He works with some pretty specific species that I think are up and coming in the hobby. They've been around for a long time, but many of these species are sort of underrated as we talk about in, in the in the episode or almost like a dark horse of the hobby some some really neat species that sh- ought to be more popular than they really are in the episode we talk about something that I've actually been critical on the podcast before as well as on the YouTube channel talking about you know going out and grabbing and buying a bunch of different animals and having a bunch of different species but Frank sort of talks about a positive side to that and how to solve that obviously we don't want everybody running out buying a whole bunch of animals and having nowhere to put them but we talk about how working with many different species can actually help you narrow down what you want to do in herpetoculture and how to make sure that the animals that you have as excess are going to the right places and and how that can be a beneficial aspect of keeping. So I thought that was really interesting to highlight something that I've definitely highlighted the other side of before in the past. So we talk about that and of course we talk about as well as the, the importance of narrowing your focus as well, working with very specific species and learning those species and understanding how they work, whether that's on a keeping or breeding level. We talk about the difference between being a breeder and a keeper, and Frank has a fairly good definition of of how he sees himself separate from keepers and the sacrifices that he has to make as a breeder, which is refreshing to hear, you know, breeders talk about. Sometimes some sacrifices do have to be made, and Frank discusses that as well. Then we break down a few of the different species that he works with, jeweled lacertas, carpet chameleons, as well as draco, which are the flying lizards, these tiny little tropical species of of lizard with an incredible adaptation. So that is a species that is not very common in the hobby right now. Typically, they come in in really rough, wild-caught shape, and very few people are working with them on a, on a captive bred level, and Frank discusses his time working with that project. And we also discuss keeping outdoors. I know we've talked about keeping outdoors before, but Frank lives in Pennsylvania, meaning he has a very short window of opportunity to keep outside, so he gives those of us who are in colder climates some tips for how to do that successfully. And if you are looking for more information on this episode or any other, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. There you can find the show notes for this episode or any other episode that has been recorded. You can also find a link to the shop so you can pick yourself up a shirt or a sweater. And $5 does automatically get donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. I don't know why I say automatically because I have to do it. It's not like it just automatically happens, but I typically make a donation about every quarter or so. So I let those build up and then we make a $100 or $200 donation depending on how many shirts were purchased and and if you do know, I also donate some of the ad revenue I make from YouTube as well as off of Amazon as well. About 10% of that goes to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. So we are over $1,000 of donations at this point over the last couple of years. So super proud of that. If you would like to support the podcast financially, you can do that for as little as $3 a month over at patreon.com slash animals at home. We had a bunch of people sign up last week or 
in the last two weeks or so, I think there's maybe 10 or so of you guys. So welcome to the team if you're one of those. Uh, super appreciate the financial support that the patrons are giving me. And if you are a patron now, you know that last week I did start a Discord server. So that allows the patrons to discuss and have conversations with each other. And of course, I pop into the server as well to add my own two cents for what it's worth. So I do really appreciate that support. And as I said last week, we're getting, I, I'm pretty close to pulling the trigger on outsourcing the, or outsourcing the editing for the podcast. That's something that I want to do because it's becoming just too difficult for me to edit with a new baby and everything and work. And I want the podcast to get back to a regular schedule. And that's going to cost five or 600 bucks a month. So I want to be able to afford that and make sure I'm not losing money on the podcast. And I think the next episode I do is going to be a test of that idea. I, I, I'm you know, run through a trial episode with this team that I'm talking with. So we'll see how it goes. So you can wish me luck on that. I am pretty reluctant to give up my editing control, but at the same time, I want to continue to produce content. I have a giant list of names of episodes that I want to get to, and I just want to focus on recording and having amazing conversations. And that's what supporting on Patreon will allow me to do. And thank you so much to CustomReptileHabitats.com for supporting the podcast. If you're looking for a new reptile enclosure, make sure you go to the show notes or the YouTube description. You'll find animalsathome.ca slash CRH. That is my affiliate link. If you do click that, a small commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you. And of course, that's another way you can help support the show. And I think that's it. Let's jump into this episode. Enjoy. Well, Frank, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for doing this. Thanks, Don. I appreciate uh, you having me. You have been on my list for a while. I have lots of people that have reached out to me. Can you have Frank on? People oh. love the content you're putting out and, and obviously you're producing beautiful animals and you're doing it in a way that I think many people appreciate. So we'll, we will get into all that. But why don't you just give us a little quick brief background or history of yourself? How did you get into the hobby and, and what are some of the, the paths or roles you've had along the way? Okay. Uh, well, I've loved reptiles. They've been my number one passion and obsession for as long as I can remember my whole life. I'm 38 years old, almost 39 at this point. And I can't remember a time in my life when I didn't have a pet reptile or several. Um, I was born in Houston, Texas, and there's some pretty good reptiles there. I'm sure that you, you know, your listeners now. Um, so my early childhood, and then eventually when my mom and I moved North to Pennsylvania, every single summer I was in Houston was spent running around catching a knolls and geckos and rattlesnakes and things like that, whatever I could find. And, um, that's just always been like a, just something I've been absolutely obsessed with. I, I don't remember ever having a time in my life where I wasn't. Um, and so it all started like pretty much every reptile keeper, I guess, like just fascinated by, uh, the, the uniqueness and diversity of reptiles and chasing them around my backyard and then eventually keeping them. And then there was a real turning point in my life when I was 12 years old, where up until that point. It had been mostly stuff that I'd caught in my backyard in Texas and maybe a few other things that my mom or my dad may have purchased for me at a pet store. But then when I was 12 years old is when it really turned for me where I wanted a blue tongue skink. I, I went to a pet store in Houston and there was an Australian Northern blue tongue skink. You know, this was nearly 30 years ago. So it was a big deal to see them. And I just, I fell in love. I thought they're amazing. And you know, my, my mom said, okay, you, you can do that, but you have to do the research and make sure that you can take care of this animal because this is not an anole that you caught in your backyard. So she made me go through the process of research. I purchased books. Um, I read everything I could find, Reptiles Magazine. And I spent several months actually doing my research and prepping my habitat for him and, and uh, eventually got him. And then that was my, I consider him my first real pet reptile. Um, his name was Sneezer. He was a Northern blue tongue skank. He's called, I call him Sneezer 12 year old kid. He came out of the, the container and the first thing he did was sneeze. So that's what I called him. Perfect and he, uh, yeah, it was great. And he was my, my buddy for a very long time. He lived to be, I had him for over 24 years Oh wow! and, and he was an adult when I got him. He was the, the first reptile that I bred when he was the father, of course, but I, he produced many babies and I have grandbabies from him and his babies actually are in uh, several AZA zoo collections and his babies have been on television and all that stuff. So he was like my, my starting point of this, you know, what it's become. Oh, that's pretty amazing. It's cool that you still have that lineage in, in, in your own home as well with, you know, yeah. them spread out in some cool facilities. And then you, you went on and did some zookeeping as well, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So I, 
so again, be, you know, that's where it started to take off for me when I was 12. And then I got into chameleons and some more exotic stuff, not just natives, um, and kept all through high school and all through college. Even I had stuff in my dorm room and in my apartment. And then uh, my halfway through college and one of the summers, we have very lucky to have a reptile based AZA zoo within an hour of my home up here in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, called Clyde Peeling's Repslam. I'd gone there a lot as a kid. And there's my mom that suggested, why don't you see if you can get a job there, you know, part-time over the summer. I'm like, ah, they never will, but let's try. So I go and I show up, I'm, you know, 19, 20 years old. And I bring my little portfolio, a manila folder with pictures in it and said, you know, I would like to come and help out. I, I love reptiles. I've kept them my whole life. And I showed them uh, pictures of the animals that I've kept and bred, chameleons and blue tongue skinks and things like that. And uh, luckily enough, uh, Chad Peeling, Clyde's son, he's, he was uh, kind of the operations manager of the zoo. He was impressed with what he saw and he took me on and I started working there part time through my summers and breaks in college and uh, went really well. I loved working there. They, they seemed to like having me and they offered me a full time position once I graduated um, from Penn State with my uh, bachelor's of science in biology, went immediately I graduated the next week. I started working for them, and then I worked for them full time several uh, two years after that. And then, even once I decided to switch careers and become an educator, I'm a biology teacher now for the past 15 years. Uh, and even after that, I spent most of those summers working at the zoo, and even like my winter breaks and fall breaks, I would still go in and help out and just enjoy working with the animals. Uh, so yeah, I was very, very lucky to have that. What was the reason to shift from what you're doing there to, to education? Was there, was that more of your passion sits or? Um, it's, it's a bit complicated. So there's several reasons I should say. Um, I loved working at the zoo and is some of my very best memories and I will cherish them forever and, and the opportunity that I had there. But they also, it wasn't, they weren't my animals and I wasn't necessarily making the decisions about what enclosures to use or, or what diet to use and things like that. I, I definitely had some freedom and some responsibility to make some decisions, but it wasn't mine, right? I was working for someone else. And so that was just not, it wasn't just quite the same. And, and also quite frankly, it, it's hard to make a living as a zookeeper, um, long term, you know, I, I envisioned having a family one day, which I do now have. And with that zookeeper salary, that didn't really seem like a possibility to me at the time. Um, so I, I started in one of the aspects of zookeeping that I just loved the most. So it wasn't like the only thing I loved about zookeeping, but I loved when I gave uh, lectures, when I gave uh, zookeeper talks, which was a big part of what uh, Clyde does at a zoo is, is education. And I really enjoyed it, showing people animals, just talking about my passion. I, and I thought, well, maybe I could do that as well. And, you know, I have a little bit more of an opportunity, um, you know, to have the means of raising a family and to have time off in the summers to still do what I want. And to also to have my animals at home and kind of do things the way that I wanted to, to be my own boss when it comes to how to care for the animals. Mm -hmm. And. As far as being a biology teacher, how, how often are you able to incorporate herpetoculture into the classroom? I'm sure you do it at least a little bit. You must. Oh, absolutely. I've had um, reptiles, amphibians, and other animals living in my classrooms for all 15 years that I've been a teacher. So they're, they're incorporated in every single day. Um, over the pandemic, when we unfortunately, of course, had to go uh, virtual teaching, one of the things that I did in the beginning to try to maintain connection with my students and to give them something that wasn't, you know, just the same old like Zoom lecture or whatever, um, was every week I would do, a, I'd call a zookeeper talk. I would dress up wearing my old zookeeper garb. I'd put an Australian hat on and I'd bring out a couple of my animals and talk about them and give basically a zookeeper lecture for 10, 15 minutes just to share with them. And one of the things that I do now is we have what we call Zoo Fridays. So every Friday, the students have the opportunity to earn the opportunity for me to, I bring in one of my animals from home 
or one of the animals I have in the classroom and I show them to them and I talk about them and they can ask questions. And if it's appropriate, they can touch and handle the animal. They not always, because not everything wants to be touched and handled by a bunch of kids, but a lot of the stuff can, but we do that every Friday. And I think that that's something that a lot of the kids really look forward to. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. And there's obviously there's so much you can use for those grade, is it grade 10, 11, 12 or 11, 12? I, so, so I taught um, high school for 11 years um, and it was like 10, 11, 12, sometimes ninth. Uh, but now when my family and I moved uh, four years ago, the past four years, I've actually switched to middle school because that oh, was okay. the job that was the job that was available to me. Uh, but I am still teaching um, life science, which is basically it's biology, except w- at a seventh grade level. So yeah, it's yeah. basically the same material, just out of geared towards a younger age. Well, and you can just incorporate so much of herpetoculture into the the the, um, the curriculum, right? I'm, sh- I'm sure there's so much crossover that you can use. Absolutely, yeah. You know, relevancy is so important and as much as possible. Like we're talking about ecosystems, we're talking about cycles, we're talking about balance. I'm pointing at my terraria in the classroom, and I'm talking about. Uh, natural selection and adaptations. I'm pulling an animal out and saying, this is an adaptation. This is why it evolved. So yeah, as often as I can, because, you know, getting the attention of uh, seventh graders up through 12th graders is not necessarily the easiest thing. So animals definitely help with that. Yeah, no, that sounds amazing. I think everybody listening probably wishes their biology teacher in high school had reptiles in the classroom because that'd be amazing. Well, let's talk a little bit about you know, the business side of how, how you're approaching herpetoculture and, and you have your breeding business and just your keeping business. So maybe you could talk about when that started and, and sort of the early days and how it's evolved. Yeah, sure. So like I said, I've always had reptiles and I've always been a reptile breeder, you know, always on a very, very small scale. And kind of, I did what most people do as they're going through and learning things is like, I want two of this, I want two of that, I want two of this and as much as possible. And You know, sometimes we tend to poo-poo that a little bit, but um, so much of what I've learned came from those early days of of learning from that and also figuring out like what I really enjoyed. You know, some, I love all reptiles. If I could only keep like, you know, name a species, I would keep it if that's all I was allowed to do. But like, I figured out which ones I truly are passionate about. Um, Is that that what you think you mainly learned from that experience of doing the sort of picking or, or the other lessons that you learned? from having uh, you know, two of each thing type thing. Well, I just, I just learned how to be a reptile keeper. Mm, like gotcha. I, there are, I just, how to be a, a reptile keeper and a reptile breeder. Like my, my, a lot of my friends that are in herpetoculture tend to make fun of me. And they say that I have a scaly thumb, you know, because everything I get seems like does well and breeds. Um, and I, I, and it's not because I'm some like genius or anything like that, far from it. But I think a lot of it is because I just have a very, wide breadth of experience, right? I was never, I didn't keep just one thing, right? Like, and also, especially like with my zookeeping days, like I can successfully breed um, like a Dactylus Williamsi blue geckos. I could breed American alligators. I could breed crocodiles. I could breed black mambas, you know, king cobras, you know, blue tongue things like you name it. And like that, and it's, and it's not, and it's simply based on experience. It's not because, of any special talent that I have. It's just because I, I have a, um, a wide variety of experience. Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting that you say that because I, I've done that before as well, where I sort of done the finger wag towards people that, you know, buy all these different things. And then in, in five or six years, they don't have any of those animals. And, 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 and partly there, you could see there's an ethical issue there, but oh, for sure. I think yeah. that speaks to the importance of having a strong community around you. If you have a strong community of keepers and friends and, and, and people that are in the hobby, along with aside you that's where trading and you know funneling animals mm-hmm. to people who you know are ethical keepers is completely viable completely reasonable way to move animals to different homes without feeling like you're you know putting them up on craigslist or something yeah and for sure and, and that's that's never been the case like for for me and where it was just like i'm bored with something now i'm dumping it you know usually it would just kind of reach its natural course and i just would not continue you know continue with that project mm-hmm. you know like i said like i i kind of throw a lot of things at the wall and see what sticks. But the, th- the fact of the matter is a lot of stuff sticks. Like I've been breeding blue tongue skinks for over 25 years, right? you know? And like, so like sometimes a project, you know, species just doesn't end up fitting with me. Um, but in you, but in a lot of cases, they'll st- I'll still just keep that one pair of animals for its life, you know, I, w- mm-hmm. but I won't continue the project. Or like you said, you know, there's, 
I've been in the, the hobby or the, the industry, whatever you want to call it long enough where I do have many connections and it's very easy for me to, to find homes, uh, you know, good homes for, for my animals. If I decide that that's not the project, that's not the species for me. And, you know, you know, I say, I haven't really done that in a very long time. You know, that was how I started out. And so like, there are very much so there are those ethical concerns. Um, and I am, such a huge proponent for people finding something that they're pa passionate about and sticking with it and devoting themselves. You know, like, you know, I mentioned how I was just listening to TC's most recent episode with you, like, you know, there needs to be more small batch breeders. I, I can't, you know, I think that that's so very important. I think that there needs to be more people that do that, but you know, we also have to have allowances and not wag our fingers too much at people that are trying to, that are young people, especially that are trying to learn and figure out what they are passionate about. Yeah. It's, it's so true. It's almost like the first year or two of going to university when you literally have no clue what you want to do. You just take every first yeah. year course and every different subject. You have to figure it out. You have to whittle it down somehow. You can't just immediately expect someone to, to stick with a, a pair of animals that they bought when they were mm -hmm. 14 and say, I'm going to go with this forever. Yeah, we all got to start somewhere for sure. Yeah, but now it seems like you have narrowed down quite a bit. Yes. So, so you have gone through Absolutely. this process of, of finding what you like. So, <laughs> so how how it's, maybe you could talk just quickly about the a few projects that you have narrowed down, and then why that's been so successful for you. Sure, and let me I, I kind of completely veered off your original question, <laughs> so I can go back to that saying and talk about like the start of the, the business side of things. So I veered way off course, so I apologize. Um, but so yeah, anyway, I started off like with everybody like. Pokemon collect them all. But then add, the more I did it, the more I found the stuff that I do really love, like chameleons, like electric blue geckos, like blue tongue skinks. And I started to stick with those species long term, generation after generation after generation, and breeding those. Um, and then I started, so for so, so much of these 30 years or whatever that I've been breeding reptiles, um, you know, it wasn't making any money whatsoever. I was spending a lot of money because it was my hobby. It's what I love. That wasn't about making money at all. But then it wasn't until um, I started breeding the electric blue gecko in some reasonable numbers. And I was like one of a very small number of people doing so in the States anyway. And people really wanted them and people were willing to pay, you know, you know what they were worth. And then I actually started, money started to come in and that's, I was like, well, maybe this can be a little bit more, um, than just, you know, money pit hobby passion, and maybe it can at least pay for itself. And then that was the first goal was like, maybe I can just recoup some of the expense and it started to go there. And then it just kept going and going. And, um, so eventually it got to the point where I was able to become a legitimate small business. Um, but it was, it wasn't until I found species like like Dacos blame site like the electric blue gecko or carpet chameleons or northern blue tongue skinks or jeweled lacertas it wasn't until i discovered those species and found my love of keeping and breeding them that you know where things really took off i never planned for this to be a business that was never the idea and i tell people that all the time sometimes people will ask me i want to be a reptile breeder I'm like, well, that shouldn't be your goal, honestly. I mean, not that, not that being a reptile breeder shouldn't be your goal, um, but being a, a professional reptile breeder where you're doing it for money, for a source of income, that shouldn't be your starting goal. I think that you're setting yourself up for failure. You have to, to first be a keeper and a small scale breeder to, to even know if you want to do that. If it is worth it to you personally, do that first, you know, that's your goal. Do it because you love the animals. And then if you are, if you do love the animals and you are good at it, then the, the business side of things, the money side of things will come later because if you're putting good stuff out into the hobby, into the business, then people will respond and it'll, it'll proceed naturally. Yeah, it's so true. It, it it is one of the things that you see a lot is people try to jump in to make money, and it's the wrong. You can't. It's not the starting point. You ha you have to have the passion for the animal first, or else you'll just be. I always say this in the podcast: running a business is difficult. It doesn't matter what the business is. So if you think you can just jump yeah. into a, a livestock business, it's not as easy as as you think. No, definitely not. Like I I wouldn't expect to be able to jump in 
any other business and be like, Oh, I'm starting this. Like, so I know nothing about running a restaurant. I wouldn't think like, Oh, you can make good money with a restaurant. I'm going to go open a restaurant. That's not how it starts. You know, I think probably the best restaurants are started with people that are passionate about cooking and passionate about food. You know, that's where it begins. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, and so now you have, so getting back to the sort of narrowing the niches down or niching down to a few species that Mm -hmm. was probably part of the intentional process, right? Yeah. So I, I strongly feel, and I figured out along the way, along my journey that I, I don't think you really know a species until you've worked with them multi-generationally, you know, generation after generation and not just two animals, right? You know, I, I know so much more about blue tongue skinks now than I did back when I was in high school, even though I was successfully breeding one or two pairs. You know, I know more now because I have 18 animals and I've been doing it for so many generations. I've learned a lot. And with the electric blue geckos, you know, same thing. Like I've learned more and I figured that species out more because I've stick with it year after year after year. And I'm not just dealing with like one or two pairs. I'm dealing with multiple pairs and trying to, you know, keep a large, diverse um, uh, stock of animals. Um, And like how I settled on these different animals. So number one, Whenever I like look at a new project or think about starting a new project is number one is does the animal absolutely excite me? Do I think that they're just like the coolest thing in the world? And if I only was allowed to keep like one or two of them, would I want to? And, you know, so number one is that that has to be number one. Do you love the animal? Are you passionate about that species? And then the second thing I look at is are there many people breeding it? do I need to be breeding it? I, so I used to breed panther chameleons. They're gorgeous. They're beautiful, wonderful animals. They're hardy. They make good pets. I don't breed them anymore because I don't need to, I don't need to breed panther chameleons anymore. There's plenty of people breeding them. There aren't plenty of people breeding carpet chameleons. Mm -hmm. They are also a beautiful, hardy, excellent chameleon to keep. So a lot of people aren't working with them. So I decided to do that. The electric blue gecko, there's a very small number of people breeding them. They make wonderful terrarium displays. I, you know, they're just, you can see them across the room and they're this big, they're three inches long, you know, but there weren't many people breeding them. So I chose that. So it makes sense from, you know, like a personal standpoint um, that it's good for the hobby Right. So it it makes sense from an ethical standpoint, excuse me, because it's, it's good for the hobby. It's increasing diversity, but it also makes sense from a business point of view because I'm not in a crowded marketplace, right? I'm, you know, there is a, there is a market for them, but I am one of the few people supplying it. So like it, it works out both ways. I think it's good for the hobby to increase the diversity of species that people are working with or have access to. Uh, but it also makes sense because I'm I'm not competing with a hundred or two hundred or who knows how many more breeders. Yeah, when you go to an expo, I'm, theoretically maybe you don't go to expos, but it's it's the electric blue geckos are going to stand out a lot. So you know you're not you're in a sea of ball pythons and core snakes, and and then you have these really yeah. interesting species that you're going to yeah. be so different from the other tables. Yeah, I, I can't. I don't bend very often because I'm not big into that side of things. I think that there are. I think that that's it. I think shows are absolutely great for networking with people and for, you know, getting to know people and to see what they have. But I prefer to sell animals online or like directly, like by email or or personal communication. I think it's better for the animal. Um, But when I do um, occasionally vend shows or when I have in the past and I bring my oddball stuff, I always have at least a handful of people say, wow. I, I'm glad that you're here. I've never seen that before. Like I appreciate seeing something different, you know, even if, you know, most people won't buy anything, but they'll be like, Oh, that's really interesting. You know, I appreciate it. You know, thanks for answering my questions. So that's always been a positive side of shows for me. Yeah. And there's for, for the listeners, you know, people that want to get into breeding, there is so much potential for these passion product projects. You know, there's so many species out there that are just like you're saying, you could look around in your local community and realize that there's no one working with them or very few in the country. And yeah. who knows if it could turn into a business one day, but to start with, you would be in a perfect market situation. Yeah. And it's just like a great place to start because you start breeding them and 
you're, you're in, it's not going to be as difficult to find good homes for them as it would to say find good homes for ball pythons or leopard geckos. You know, even if you are producing quality animals, like it might be hard to find homes for them because there's so many available. So, and again, even if you don't like end up sticking with it long term, at least it will be easy to to ethically place the offspring that you do produce. You know, and then and then maybe some of those people will will make that their project. So, uh, instead of just that species disappearing um, altogether from the yeah. hobby. Exactly. And, and something else that I've noticed with the animals that you're working with, for the most part, is they are quite small. And I don't know if that was intentional, but you, you work with very small species. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. It was very intentional um, because I don't have like an aesthetic um, preference for smaller reptiles. Like I kept Parsons chameleons for a while, you know, and the zoo worked with some quite large reptiles. I've worked with Komodos, you know, Galapagos tortoises, like all those sorts of things. Like I love big green iguanas and rhino iguanas. Like I love big reptiles. People often assume I don't like that stuff, but for me, it boils down to two things. It's in one of them is altruistic and one of them is selfish. And I'll start with the altruistic side. I, it's more ethical. I'm able to more ethically keep smaller reptiles than I am able to keep larger reptiles. I have limited space. I have limited funds. If a two foot cubed enclosure is a mansion for an electric blue gecko, that's three inches long. I can provide it with huge amount, like uh, compared to its body, large amounts of space, extreme stratification, all sorts of enrichment opportunities that can make it beautiful, well planted. And you might not even see the animal sometimes that same size space a bearded dragon would be cramped in mm -hmm. right and yeah. that's not even and that's not even a very big reptile right that's like a medium sized reptile so that's one side of it for me is like i think that it's it's i'm not comfortable cramming stuff in to the bare minimum um you know that's something that i try to i'm trying to get away from as far as possible you know that's like old school and, you know, I am an old, school. I'm, I'm a bit of a weird keeper because I think I straddle the line between the old school and the new school, you know, I, you know, cause I've been around for a while, but at the same time, I still want to be progressive and push myself forward and push my animal care forward. So that's number one is it, I believe for me personally, I am, I feel more comfortable keeping smaller species because I believe I can provide them with more. I don't, I would not, I don't feel like I would be able to provide medium to larger reptiles with the quality of care that I would like to. And the second thing that is completely selfish and capitalistic is economy of space for compared to what I can produce. So I produce electric blue geckos and spear point leaf tail geckos that are this big that are worth hundreds of dollars a piece in a relatively small enclosure. And so I, I can have, I can ethically keep relatively large numbers of them and produce relatively large numbers. And the babies are as big as my pinky nail, right. you know, when they hatch out. So I can house them in a way that's ethical with automatic misting, with ultraviolet light, with daylight, with halogen heat, you know, all that's in fully planted bioactive. All my babies are housed that way, just like the adults. I couldn't do that if I was dealing with larger, um, larger species. Um, and so I can provide quality of care, but at the same time, I get more dollars per square foot that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it yeah. works out both ways. Well, and I think there's, I'm sure when you sell an animal, even if it's too, a, a newer keeper, you can probably feel more confident that they're going to have at least enough space for it. And you're dealing with an electric blue day gecko or uh, yeah. Yeah. Day gecko, right. That's their common sure. name, right? They, electric or blue day gecko. Okay, yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. You know, I wasn't I, sure I, if the day was in the common name or not. It does. I just call him William Sy, you know, yeah, I, yeah. I, and I'm, I'm more like a scientific names guy. Uh, but at the same time, like I'm not, I'm not, I'm also not one of those scientific name guys. There's like, you're not allowed to use the common name. I don't like that though either. <laughs> yeah. 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 For me, it oh. doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, um, when you sell an electric blue gecko, you know that that person's probably going to have enough space. You're not selling yes. a reticulated Python and asking if they have a room separated for it. Exactly right. Like the, the commercial reptile housing that's commonly available is geared towards smaller species, or at least it should be because mm -hmm. that's all the bigger it is. 
you know, so you can walk into any pet store in the United States and I'm sure in Canada, and you can purchase a habitat, a terrarium that is appropriate for an electric blue gecko throughout its entire life. You, I, I, you would be stretched, I think, to walk into your average pet store and purchase a habitat that would be appropriate for a bearded dragon for its entire life, the most commonly kept pet lizard in the world. And yeah. you, can't, you can't even buy an appropriately sized habitat for it in a pet store. You either have to buy a specialty one online or you have to build one yourself. It's one of the craziest things about the the consumerism side of the pet trade is exactly that is so many of the animals that get sold in these chain stores, you actually can't buy the equipment in the store and there's no avenue for these keepers to to figure out. They just go and buy the Exoterra with the bearded dragon on it and think that's perfect. And like um, chameleon guy, you know, for so long, veiled chameleons and panther chameleons. Again, same thing. Like what if you're lucky, you can find a two foot by two foot by four foot tall a uh, screen enclosure for a chameleon. And, but I'm telling you, that is bare minimum. If you've seen an adult panther chameleon or an adult male bailed chameleon in a two by two by four, it has almost no room to move. The animal itself is two foot long with the tail. Right. Right. We, we recommend that as the minimum enclosure size for this species because that's all that's available. I mean, I can't wait. Like I, I do uh, work with, with leap habitats, a new, uh, uh, enclosure company that's coming out. Like I can't wait for our four foot long chameleon enclosures to come out because you know there is no commercially available in you know size for these medium sized reptiles. Medium yeah. people want medium sized reptiles because they're not they're not as like scary small as like some of the small ones. Like I, I get why people feel that way, why they want something a little bit bigger. Um, like a bearded dragon or a blue tongue skink, because it's like, you know, you less like you, you're less fearful to break the thing or to lose yes. it or something. So I get that, but we do also need to make sure that we are providing for it in an appropriate way. And, you know, in most cases, best case scenario, what you can find at a pet store for a bearded dragon is, is 36 inches long, right? Yes. That's best case, right? So do you think that the hobby does a bad job of this? I mean, it's it's hard to it's more of like a chicken or the egg thing like how this has happened but do you think that in general the hobby promotes larger species too much or we should be focusing more on small species it's kind of hard you don't want to point the blame at anybody but yeah. we do have a lot of animals and enclosures that are way too small yeah i think it's complicated um for sure um so the, here's the thing bearded dragons and blue tongue skinks you know they're similar similar size lizards um they make great pets they're phenomenal pets mm-hmm. they're engaging they're very hardy you know they're just awesome and i just think that we never we never caught up from the old days where you throw it in an aquarium and it's a reptile so it's stupid so it doesn't matter Mm -hmm. right it's simple it's a simpleton animal it doesn't matter it's not a dog who and it's fine you know that we i don't think we've quite evolved past i think that we're starting to i think that those of us that are have been in for a while and also especially maybe people that haven't been in it for a while that are approaching it, you know, these um, from a more kind of ethical point of view, understanding now that no, these animals are not stupid. You know, they aren't simple. They do have relatively complex brains and complex behaviors. So I, I think that things are starting to shift, but I just, I think that especially like with the supply side of things, we're just, it's just lag, you know, we're just, we're not caught up to where, you know, a lot of us are starting to get mentally, the supply side of things just hasn't quite caught up there. And, you know, it's, it's more expensive to buy larger stuff. So like I said, it, it's complicated. I don't think any one factor is to blame. I think we're just a little bit behind in the hobby. Uh, I think that there's plenty of space to grow. And I think that people do want to grow in that direction. Um, but I do, I would like to see not a de-emphasis on these medium-sized animals, but like, like a leopard gecko, you know, is like, that's also like one of the top five most popular reptiles, right? Like that's like, man, that's a perfect size animal, isn't it? Or a crested gecko or a gargoyle gecko. Like it is easy to provide that animal with a large uh, enriching habitat. It's easy to do so. Um, So I don't think that we need to get away from like these medium-sized reptiles. Um, but I do think that we need to continue, and of course you do, to promote um, better and better um, care for them. I do think we need to, as a hobby, 
and I'm sure this is going to upset people, some people, but I do think we need to get away from promoting large species in the hobby, yeah. you know, because the fact of the matter, and I, again, I'll say, I say this once in a while, like on Facebook or whatever, and I'll catch some flack for it. But I think that most reasonable people would agree that your average person cannot provide for a green iguana or for a reticulated python or a, or a Burmese python or a rhinoceros iguana, you know, or a salcata tortoise, honestly, mm -hmm. you know, like the average person cannot provide for them or won't anyway. So I do think that there needs to be way more education and de-emphasis on the breeding of those large species mm -hmm. of reptiles. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that's, that's definitely, and that's where a lot of not, not is more of a generalization, but a lot of poor care comes in those scenarios because of that, because you just don't have the room and the yeah. animals end up in small enclosures. And, and one thing that I really like that you do on your YouTube channel that I hear you say all the time is you really make a point to distinguish the difference between keepers and breeders. And I yeah. don't often hear breeders do that. And a lot of times you hear the opposite where breeders have a more of an industrialized setup, like really industrialized. We're talking like racks and paper. And then yeah. they try to convince people that that's all they need rather than yes. just saying, I'm just doing this to breed. So maybe you could just talk about how you see the difference between those two things. Absolutely. So again, I, I feel like I straddle this line. At least I try to, where I try to see both sides because both are necessary in order for, for there to be pet reptiles. There needs to be both breeders and there needs to be pet keepers. There needs to be both. And they aren't the same. And I think that we need to not demonize breeders as is sometimes done. Not always. Most, not, most people don't do that. But some people demonize breeders and kind of put all of us under the umbrella of the, the puppy mill type uh, impression. Um, and there are certainly breeders that are like that but a lot are not. Um, so I just, I think it's important to realize that a breeders are absolutely necessary. If you want to keep a pet reptile, if you want a reptile, breeders are necessary. I am a big believer in the fact that no one for any reason whatsoever should buy a wild caught reptile as a pet. Mm -hmm. There is no reason to pull an animal out of the wild and keep it for the sole purpose of as a pet in your home. I am very much for the ethical inhumane collection and sale of reptiles from the wild to established breeders. Mm -hmm. the, it's, so, it's so unfortunate in this hobby where it's everything is like flipped. The cheap reptiles are the imported ones. And that's often what the beginning keeper buys. And that's what they should not be buying because a, it's not really ethical and B, it's not good for, it's not going to be a great experience for them. Wild cutting animals have so much uh, trauma, you know, you know, physically that they're going through and they need a lot of uh, palliative care to, to come out of that. So it's a difficult experience for them. So without breeders, that's all that would be available is wild caught animals. So their breeders need, to, need to exist. Otherwise pet reptiles could not really exist unless they're wild caught. Um, so we do need to kind of cut breeders a little bit of slack, I think. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I, a keeper, I believe has, if you have a, a handful of reptiles, you know, and your job is not to breed uh, on a small or medium or a large scale, then I think you have a responsibility to provide those pets with the highest level of care that we know how to give. Right. If that's if your if your goal is to keep pets, then that's what you should do. Breeders like myself, the biggest corner that I have to cut as a breeder is space. Mm -hmm. I would like to provide, especially like my medium-sized lizards like blue tongue skinks and jeweled lacertas, I would love to be able to provide them with more. Right. You know, I keep and TC keeps his northerns in three foot by two foot tubs. And I keep my jeweled lacertas in similar size things, which is twice the size of a V70 rack, which was what most breeders keep their blue tongue skinks in. But for me, that is so bare minimum. And I, I think it's, I think it's, it's above the minimum of what, how they're often kept. But for me, it's so, I, as a, I would not recommend a pet keeper to keep a blue tongue skink in a three by two. Like, can it be done and are my animals healthy? Absolutely. But would it be better for the animal to be in something bigger? You bet. 
So that's the area um, that I think that I I think is a big distinction. We have to understand that if a person is going to breed and sell and make a reasonable return, a reasonable profit on the reptiles that they're, they're selling, that they are not going to be able to have as big as habitats of, of enclosures as we would like. And because, you know, and you and TC talked about this a little bit, uh, I think, you know, profit gets a little bit of a bad rap, but um a reptile breeder needs to make some profit. It needs to be worth their time. Otherwise, why do it? Yeah. You know, I mean, of course, like for the enjoyment, I would, I would be keeping reptiles no matter what I have been for most of my life and losing a lot of money at it. Um, but to be a breeder on any scale, providing healthy captive bred animals for the pet industry, you know, that takes a lot of money and I need to make that back. And I also need to pay my bills. I need to make sure that my wife and kid have clothes and food and all that. And our cars are paid for and all that stuff. So there has to be able to be a return on it, which means that I can't give room sized enclosures. You know, I definitely want to go above minimum and I do want to provide natural, you know, as close to natural lighting as I can in appropriate heat sources, like using halogen heat bulbs instead of heat tape, mm -hmm. um, using LED bright light for the plants instead of just one dim bulb, you know, providing UV light for all of my animals, that sort of thing. So those are, those are areas where maybe we shouldn't cut breeders too much of a, a, a break on because, you know, it can still be done um, and you can still make a profit. Now, as much profit as if you're putting everything in a Tupperware container? No, of course not. But you know, it's still possible to to make money doing that. I think I know it because I do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And I mean, when you look at your enclosures, it's hard to tell that any corners have been cut, especially to the layman who may not be super familiar with the species that you're working with. They, they would probably not even recognize that maybe you could go a little bit larger. I mean, like yeah. you said, a lot of these things are above average anyway, but you have well-planted tanks, like proper lighting. A lot of them are bioactive or most of them are. And most, yeah. it's... It, like you said, there, it's okay to cut certain corners as long as you're being honest about why, and also mm -hmm. letting people know that hey, when you get this animal, I recommend going bigger for the for the space. Yeah, I I just think there's such again nobody seems to have talked about it until now, and I and I think part of it is defensiveness on like the breeder's standpoint, and and because I know that because I felt that way too. Like I did not adopt this progressive mindset overnight, right? I like I said, like I came from the old school of reptile keeping it. And I did not switch to the new school overnight. It took some work in here for that to happen. Um, so how, how did that, how did that happen? Was it, was there anything, one thing, or was it just a slow burn that you just slowly started to slow, realize? Slow burn, slow burn. So I just remember like, I'd hear certain things about like, you should provide and, and, I, and I'll, and I'll admit to this. I don't care. I don't, I don't mind admitting when I'm wrong. Somebody, you know, saying you should provide, all, that blue tongue skink should have ultraviolet light, for instance. Well, no, they don't because I bred them 20 years ago and they, they didn't have UV light, so they don't need it. So that's not true. Or then like only nocturnal animals, nocturnal reptiles should have UV light too. And then and I'm like, well, no, they shouldn't. They're in a hole all day. Why do they need that? And so like, I was very resistant to those things at first, but but the more I thought about it, and the more I did research and the more I tried to, the more space and time I allowed myself for that, the more I realized, no, that was just my defensiveness because that was me. When, when you accept that, you have to accept the fact that you've not been keeping animals to the highest standard. And that's a hard pill to swallow, but I swallowed that pill and I feel a lot better for having taken that medicine because now every one of my adult blue tongues has ultraviolet light has halogen heat and the difference in their behavior, in their coloration, in their muscular vigor is night and day, mm -hmm. right? And it's every single one of my diet. And it's just, and like, it just makes sense. A blue tongue skink is a diurnal animal. It's out in the sun for half the day. You know, like, yes, people are like, well, they hide. Well, yeah, of course they hide. They're a reptile. They're a food source for other animals. They spend a lot of time hiding, but they spend a lot of time in the sun too. Like it's, it's just like, 
when I, when I think back, I just like, like cringe thinking about the <laughs> fact that I used to say to keep that a diurnal animal didn't need UV light. Like, it's just like, just stupid. And I'm calling myself stupid. So it's okay. Uh, but then like, even now I'm like, I have one rack still in my collection and there's like, eight gecko eight nocturnal geckos in it and i can't wait to get them out right it's just mm -hmm. a matter of of setting up the new habitats and finding the the money and the space to do so you know so like i can't wait for that because i've kept because when i switched from keeping crested geckos in tubs to crested geckos in planted vivaria they they look better they act naturally and my enjoyment of them of keep i'm still breeding them you know what I mean? Like I'm still breeding them, I'm still producing eggs, I'm still making money off of them, but now I enjoy it more. And now the animals are more active and they physically look better. So it's just like, it was just like a little, a little bit by little, and I'm, I'm coming across as really judgmental right now. And I, I hopefully not to, to too many people, but like that, that, I'm just talking about my own personal journey. I'm not talking about other people, just myself. You know, I, I've just, I've just do these one little thing at a time. It's just, been this thing that's built and it only makes sense to try to improve what we're doing right no we shouldn't get to a point where we're done right that doesn't exactly. make sense in life that doesn't make sense in any aspect of life including reptile keeping like we're never done we should always strive to be better so that's that's the mindset that i'm in now well on the and on the flip side it is it would be so easy to see from the old school bre breeders sort of perspective like imagine you have a wall of animals and you're doing a great job raising healthy animals and bringing them into the hobby and, and the people are buying them and then you have one you know 16 year old kid who buys one you know skink and then suddenly realizes that they need uv and now he's standing on his soapbox and yelling at you and finger wagging I, it's in I get it's, it. in, it's yeah it's so easy to see why the walls get come up and you you would think well you should even appreciate the skink i bred for you you know yeah, I, I very much get it from that side of things because I was on that side of things. And, you know, it's it's hard to argue with the fact that there are ball python breeders that have been doing it for a very long time and their animals are living for decades and they look good and they are physically healthy. So that is a hard thing to argue uh, with, but I, I do think that you know, with the explosion and popularity of ball pythons, with the, the discovery that they will breed well in those types of setups, for some reason, well, not, it's pretty obvious, I guess, but like, that was adopted for everything, mm -hmm. for, for corn snakes, for milk snakes, for boas, um, for, for cobras, for leopard geckos, you know, for blue tongue skinks, even, you know, what I mean, like, for whatever this, this tub thing, which worked well for ball pythons like was just adopted to everything so then it just became like the standard of care when it doesn't need to be and just because one species might tolerate it very well doesn't mean that all species will and just because a species tolerates it well doesn't mean that it's optimum yeah Absolutely. Well, why don't we get into some of the species that, that you do work with on a little more of a detailed level? Because one of the things that you'd said in, you did a recent video on the jeweled lacertas. And, yeah. and what you'd said in that is that you think it's one of the most underrated lizards in the hobby. So I, I was hoping you could yeah. expand on that. Why do you think that? Absolutely. I'm going to expand it even more and say it's the most underrated reptile in the hobby. You're not a lizard snake, you know, no clarifier. I think they're, they're just amazing because they're smaller than a bearded dragon. They're smaller than a blue tongue skank. They're day active. They're bold. They're brightly colored. They are hardier than a bearded dragon or a blue tongue skank. They come from Europe. They experience strong seasonal variation. They can take 100 degrees Fahrenheit and they can take 35 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, within, within reason under the appropriate conditions. But they're, and they're smart. You know, they're like a monitor or a tegu. In terms of intelligence, I target train with my Lacertas. I've developed more trusting bonds with my Lacertas than any other reptile that I have, including blue tongue skinks. Blue tongue skinks, which I love, my blue tongue skinks will come over and feed from my hands. I don't have a blue tongue skink that that target trains that will crawl up my arm that investigates the way a jeweled Lacerta does. Because so, the, so their behaviors are just so interesting. They're so active. Um, they have great um, um, interspe interspecies communication and behaviors. 
and they're, they're beautiful. They're easy to breed. So for somebody who's looking for a breeding project, um, they're, they're, they're not difficult to breed. They're very prolific. And like I said, just hardy, hardy, hardy. Like, you know, I, I, I'm hard pressed to find a, a, a diurnal lizard um, that's as hardy as a jeweled lacerda. Why do you think they haven't had more of a popularity in herpetoculture? Because it, I mean, uh, you hit all the selling points there. Yeah, I don't know. I so I think a big part of it, and I'm trying to fix this, is I just don't think anybody has marketed them. You know, nobody has has tried to market them for what they are. I even sp- a few people I, I've spoken to that do breed them. They're like, well, I don't want them to catch on. I don't want them to become ball pythons. It's like, well, why not? Like, they're great pets. You love them. They're like, I know, but they're special. And I don't want them to like, so that's not the attitude I have. I I think that they just, for whatever reason, they just haven't been marketed right. Um, They haven't, the public, the, you know, the beginning reptile keepers just haven't been educated, haven't been shown how great they are. And so that's something that I'm trying to change. Uh, because I think that there's huge potential there because I do think that they are, um, a more appropriate pet than say a bearded dragon. And, uh, I, I, man, I just, so I get so much enjoyment out of them and everyone that every one of my customers that buys them, I, I just like, I love this lizard. They're so great. You know, like it, it's I, a lot of positive feedback. So I think that it, it's definitely going in the right direction. Well, and I think this is probably more of a subjective thing on my part, but the, as far as the beauty goes between a jeweled lacerta and a bearded dragon, for example. I mean, the jeweled lacerta is unbelievable. It's amazing to look at. And I mean, not saying bearded dragons aren't cool, but I mean, they're pretty drab compared to a a jeweled lacerta. Yeah. And you don't, and there's no, and that's their natural coloration. We're not talking selective breeding. We're not talking um, um, a lot of uh, inbreeding for recessive traits. They do have for the, the, the person that's into that sort of thing, they do have, a commonly occurring recessive trait melanism. So there are jet black jeweled lacertas and it's a simple recessive. So I produce some of those. Um, and so it's a really neat contrast. So you can have this animal that's bright green with huge blue ocelli eye spots on the side, or you can have a jet black one. It's the same species. So it's pretty cool. And, and like you talked about, they do have in, in their native locations have quite a seasonality about them. And I think you do go through them, put them through a hibernation in your garage. I think you had said, is that yes, something that sir. when you sell an animal to maybe a beginner, are you asking them that they are telling them that they should do that? Yes. Um, so if I had to pick one reason why they haven't caught, caught on is I think that people are a little bit afraid of reptile hibernation or brumation. Um, because they just aren't sure what to do with it. And, you know, maybe it just kind of freaks them out a little bit, I think. Um, but it's not difficult. And I do encourage it. I think that it is uh, necessary for the long-term health of the animal. Um, so yeah, I do provide that in my care information. Um, it's necessary for breeding. The, uh, the males won't uh, go through spermatogenesis. They won't produce sperm cells, um, fertile sperm cells, unless they are cooled. And plus, it's just a lot of breeders do this with uh, with snakes and whatnot, too, as you cool them down for the season. You get to have a nice little break in the winter um, so you can kind of pull back from the hobby. I think that's a major issue that needs to be discussed a lot more in the hobby is seasonality is so many of our reptiles are not like purely tropical where they, they experience no seasonality. The major, I'd say the majority of them do experience some seasonality and it benefits them to to have that. So yeah, I, to hibernate mine, I do, um, reduce their temperatures to above freezing. Um, I, I shoot for around 50 degrees Fahrenheit and I put them into smaller enclosures, um, with some soil and some hides, um, and some fresh water. And then I put them in my garage and there they sit for, um, two to three months. I do keep my Lacertas outside for much of the summer because that's about all I can do here in Pennsylvania, which is in the Northeast of the United States. Um, and then, so I just, then I keep them out there in the summer and then in the fall. So I let them kind of naturally slow down. And once it starts to get close to freezing temperatures, then I pull them inside just for safety's sake. They can withstand freezing temperatures if they have enough soil to bury in to stay below the frost line. Um, but I don't want to push it. It's not worth the risk. So I, I pull them in. So it's it's cool, but mild. 
Um, but I know plenty of people that live in more tropical areas or don't have a cool garage or basement, <clears throat> excuse me, where they uh, will hibernate them in like a wine cooler, like a, basically a fridge for wine and do the same thing and put them in that and at around 50 degrees Fahrenheit and let them just rest for two months and let them sleep and then gradually warm them up in the spring. And then they're ready to go. They're ready to mate. And when you do that, they're all synchronized. Like I have four female jewel desertas and they all laid their first clutch this year within two or three days of each other. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, they, they are a really beautiful species. And, and I guess that would be one downside. But like you said, it is kind of nice to have a bit of break if, if you're mm-hmm. going through that seasonality. And, and like you said, even some of the tropical species that might not have a massive temperature swing, they're still going to go through a fasting period or a period where there's not a lot of food in their natural habitat. Like for me, my snakes are just about to break their winter fast on the mm-hmm. weekend. And it's just nice. It's nice for those couple of months to just not have to worry about feeding, just doing waters and you know, is. Do health checks and whatnot. But that it's kind of a, a break mentally. It- yeah, I've, I've, I've spoken with many reptile keepers and breeders where they, where we look forward to that break and we're like, we can kind of relax a little bit. We're not raising so many babies and not feeding everything. But then, of course, at the end of winter, we're all like, oh, my God, I can't wait to get those things up. I miss them. You know, like I miss my jewel desertas because like they're so interactive. So I like I, I look forward to the break, but then I also really look forward to bringing them back up. Um, and like you mentioned, like with other species, like I have a lot of people when I saw my, my carpet chameleons and other chameleon species, people will message me like my chameleon hasn't eaten like it usually has. And it's always in the dead of winter or it's like approaching winter. I'm like, well, that's normal for this time of year. Or like, like the, the colors don't look as good. And like, that's normal for this time of year. They tend to go through, um, a winter rest where they don't shut down, they don't hibernate or brumate, but they do slow down quite a bit. And I'm like, they'll be fine as long as you're providing the good care that you've been providing. They'll, when it warms up, they'll they'll wake back up a little bit. Well, uh, the carpet chameleons is, is another species that seems like it should be more popular than it is because I, I personally think they're even more striking than a panther. I mean, I love panthers too. They're amazing. But the blacks on a carpet pan, a carpet chameleon is just makes everything so stunning. And, yeah. and they're small. They're so small that it's like almost more of a perfect pet. So why aren't those taking off? Are they more difficult than a panther? Not really. So in, in you know, my opinion, they are the best pet chameleon, a carpet chameleon. Um, in terms of keeping a captive bred carpet chameleon is just as easy as a panther chameleon. So carpet chameleons for many years have had a very negative reputation of being delicate and difficult to keep. And that was because all that was available was wild caught animals. And these animals, when they are wild caught, they go through a major ordeal and they have a lot to recover from. And many of them simply can because the wild caught animal has massive renal failure, kidney failure from the dehydration, and they physically cannot recover or it'll seem like they recover for a little bit and then crash. And it's because of what's happened to them. So that's all that people experienced for the longest time with carpet chameleons. And so people shied away from them because it's going to be dead in a few months. You know, that's not a good animal to keep. Then it wasn't until a good friend of mine, Kevin Stanford, uh, he started producing captive bred carpet chameleons that people, including myself, started to realize, well, they're not that bad. They're actually no harder than any other species of chameleon. In fact, they're quite a bit easier than most of the species. And the reason why I think they're the the best pet chameleon is because of their size. You put an adult male panther, we talked about this already, you put an adult male panther chameleon in a two by two by four foot enclosure, it's crammed. Its body, including its entire length, is two feet long. You put a carpet chameleon in a two by two by four foot enclosure and it's a mansion and it has so much space to explore and to do natural behaviors and hunt. And like it, you won't see the animal half the time because it has all this space. So it's just so much more realistic to provide the animal with good care than it is for another one. And and the importance is it's just, um, they have to be captive bred, captive bred, um, carpet chameleons are just as hardy as any other chameleon you can get. They are a little bit harder to breed than say a panther chameleon. Panthers you know, are very easy to breed. Carpets take a little bit more work. Female carpet chameleons that are breeding are a bit delicate and have to be handled with kid gloves and, and it's not for beginners. Keeping, keeping uh, carpet chameleons as pets 
is no more difficult than any other species of chameleon. Not for beginners, but also not advanced either. Uh, captive bred carpets, I would classify as in intermediate species. Mm. Well, I, I do hope they catch on a little bit more because I would love to see them to be a little more popular. And, and they're, they're such, like I said, they're such a beautiful species. I think that they will. So I'm really starting to see so between, you know, myself and, you know, Kevin in the past and my other good friend, Tim Marks, we, we breed them. Um, I think that there, I've seen a major increase in their popularity. I can't produce enough of them. I, yeah. I can't. I, I, wish I, I wish that I had more space that I could expand. Um, but I don't at the time because they are really starting to increase in popularity. Like they're not like, they're not a panther chameleon or a veiled chameleon but way more people know about carpet chameleons than they did five years ago. And hopefully that trend continues. Yeah. And I know for, I, I think I saw later this, you're doing two podcasts this week. It looks like is later this am, week, yeah. you're on, uh, on Bill's show, right? This, it'll, this yeah. will already be, or this won't be out until after that, but for anyone that wants to go back, okay. I think it's, uh, it's, is it a live show this week or? It is a live show actually. Yeah. Bill and I have uh, been acquaintances and been friends for quite a few years because he's an old time chameleon keeper. I've been on his podcast, I think, three times already. Um, and one of those times was discussing carpet chameleons, and he wants to have me back on to talk about them because he recognizes that their popularity is booming and also recognizes that they are an amazing pet chameleon because of their size and hardiness. So I'm, you know, lucky to be on, you know, two great shows in one week. And it's funny because I guess people will see me on that show before on this one. Yes, um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But a, and, a busy, but a very good week for me. I'm very happy yeah, about it. No, that's awesome. And if anyone wants more information on carpet chameleons, that, that'll be the show to go to then. And one, one Absolutely. other project that I, I really want to talk to you about, because this is probably the most niche project you work on, is the, the Dr Draco flying lizards. This yeah. is kind of a, a crazy project because this is very an unpopular animal. You, like, you don't see a lot of them, or at least I don't in Canada especially. And I think they come yeah. in a lot of wild caught, a lot of death. And, and you've sort of started tackling this. So why don't you just tell us how you got into this project and, and how it's going? Sure. Well, it's very much a mixed bag. Um, and the project started completely on accident. I was at a, a reptile show and I just happened to see some that looked like they were in good condition. Usually you see them and they don't look very good. Small, delicate rainforest lizards often suffer from major dehydration from the importation process. These didn't look bad. These look pretty good, but just like with chameleons 30 years ago, the, the information was you can't keep these alive, right? You can't keep these, you can't breed these. Um, one of the things people say is they need ants to survive, you know, that sort of thing. But there, there they were at the show. They were very cheap as many wild caught reptiles were. And I thought, well, they're here and, you know, maybe I won't have success, but I, I think they stand as good a chance with me as they would with anybody. So is I'm, there a part of you that's competitive in a way where you, when you hear it, something can't be kept that you go, I got to try this. I am absurdly competitive. Okay. That's I, have, what I, figured. I, you know, I have a major competitive and arrogant streak that I, that I personally try to keep in check as much as possible. That's like part of who I am that I uh, continuously try to work on. So I am extremely competitive and extremely arrogant. So if somebody says you can't do that, I'm going to do that <laughs> or, at least, yeah, yeah. or at least try to, I can't help it. So that was a huge part of it. Um, so I definitely pick species that people say that, and that was one of them. And so I tried it and I treated them just like chameleons. I'm very experienced with uh, acclimating wild caught chameleons and I, uh, treated them like that. And I went through the hydration process and they did great and they did great and they did great. And I'm like, well, maybe I'll try to start introducing them. And I did, and they started breeding and they started laying eggs and laying eggs and, you know, like every month. And, and I didn't have a big group. I, I had like, I think at most like three pairs, six animals. So not too many. Um, and they just did well. And the eggs, the females, lived and the males lived and um the eggs hatched now we're getting and that was the great part right now we're getting to the the mixed bag part the not so great part i had i really struggled with um the babies to only 25 percent of the babies that i hatched um made it long term the other 75 percent did they failed to thrive so i clearly was not um providing something uh that they needed or i was 
providing something that was bad for them um, because I don't believe it was um, hatchling health because they hatched vigorously and were well-sized and active when they first hatched out. Um, so I don't think that was it at all. I think that I did something wrong and um, I think I know what I did wrong and I want to correct that in the future. Um, unfortunately, my last um, wild caught female passed not that long ago. I had her for two years as an adult, which I thought I, I'm very happy with. I feel like that was a great accomplishment, you know, to keep an animal this big, which probably doesn't have a very long lifespan. Mm -hmm. um, for that length of time where, you know, everyone else said you can't keep them for more than a few months. Um, so I, so there's a species where at least keeping them, I don't think is as complicated as people make out. I think that because they're cheap, most of the people that bought them, they treated them cheaply. I didn't treat them cheaply. I didn't throw four or five of them together in one enclosure. I kept them individually. I paid very close attention to hydration and I, I did my best with them. And I treated them like I would a thousand dollar Parsons chameleon, you know, mm -hmm. even though, even though it was a $20 imported lizard, you know, and I think I just went into it from that, that uh, point of view. And so I would say I had limited success with them. Uh, unfortunately, since uh, COVID, I have not seen any imported animals come in. I, I've been on the lookout. Um, but ever since that time, over two years ago, I have not seen any new wild caught ones come in. So I haven't had the opportunity to restart it. Unfortunately, the, the hands, like I said, 25% of the eggs I hatched survived. Unfortunately, they were all males. So, um, you know, yeah, it's just bad luck or there's something going, I think it was just bad, bad odds. Cause I didn't hatch that many, you know, I hatched like a, you know, a dozen because they only lay four eggs at a time. Mm. So I hatched like 12 or 16 animals. I forget exactly. Um, but yeah, so I, that's a project that's basically on hiatus at that, at this point, I'd like to get back into it again. I think that it's possible. Um, I, I, I just, obviously I need to figure out what I did wrong with the babies and hopefully I can fix that. And, and as far as what you think you did wrong with the babies, is that something that you're willing to talk about or is that something you still want oh, to work course. out before? Oh, okay. Yeah. What do you, oh, what do you yeah. think it was? No, I'm a, I'm an open book. I don't, I don't hold anything back. I, I think that I was providing them with too much UV and I mm -hmm. think that they needed higher humidity. Again, okay. these things, when they, ha when they hatch out, you know, they can fit on a penny you know, on, on your thumbnail, they're, they're tiny, tiny little things. And I think that I blasted them with too much ultraviolet light. Um, and I think that they could have used, um, more humidity and more watering opportunities. So I think that, because again, like you, the, the difference in humidity of, and de between dehydration and hydration for an animal this big is yeah. a drop of water. Right. Right. You know, yeah. So like, it's so easy to mess up. Um, and I do think that if I correct those things by reducing a, the intensity of UV light, uh, be reducing the duration of UV light, and then, um, couple that with making sure that the humidity stays higher, more consistently, it's a tricky balance with these tropical reptiles because you want high humidity without making it stagnant. So it's, um, it's a tricky balance, but I, I think, I think that's my guess that I did wrong. And that's what I'm going to try to fix. Mm. And then as far as the process that you use for wild caught chameleons or any wild caught lizard for rehydrating, is there, is it the same sort of system that you use every time or what do you do mm -hmm. to make sure that you're hydrating these guys? Yeah, it's really simple. Honestly, it's not magic. Um, I just miss them a lot. Okay. Like they're you, just like a lot, a lot again, again, being careful not to make your enclosure a stagnant bacterial soup. So it's very important. <clears throat> I wouldn't put a wild caught chameleon or a wild Draco in a bioactive enclosure, for instance, right? Because I need to be able to water them for an hour. Like wow. just, yeah, exactly. And I think that people just don't realize the state that these animals, the things that they have to go through and the dehydration they go through and how long it takes. And that doesn't last forever. You only have to do that for a week or two. But I would, you know, wild caught chameleons or wild caught tropical reptiles of any kind, it's not uncommon to let my misting pump go for an hour at a time. And you, but of course, then you have to be able to accommodate for the drainage of that. So I just think yes. that for wild caught reptiles, 
we drastically underestimate um, how much uh, moisture they need to recuperate. Yeah, you need to simulate a rainfall, basically, not just a morning dew is not going to do it. Correct. Exactly. Yeah, well, they are a, a, such a remarkable, interesting species, and I hope one day they take off as well because they're quite small, and not much bigger than an anole or maybe a little bit bigger. And Absolutely. And such a neat, amazing animal with a crazy adaptation. And, and quite honestly, I found captive bred and, and even established wild caught to be very hardy. I, mm. basi- I basically found them to be bulletproof. They were not. Once they were established, they were not delicate at all. And especially the captive bred, they were just as easy as an anole. Oh, cool. Yeah, that, that's, that's a really interesting species. And you had mentioned earlier when we were talking about the jewel deserta, as far as you were keeping, you, you do keep some animals outside during the summer and you mm-hmm. have a, a winter climate. You live, you live in a place where you get snow and yep. oh, I assume there's snow. Oh yeah, very much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so do you have any tips for people that, because there's a lot of people that live in climates like both of us live in where you only have a short window of time where you could keep outside. So in some yeah. ways it seems like a waste, but in other ways it seems, you know, you could offer so much space and the, the sun and whatnot. Oh, yeah. So, is there anything you've picked up along the way to make that process easier? Sure. Well, I mean, I will start off with just a piece of advice and say, even if your window is short, take advantage of that window. It's worth it in the health of the animals. Cause I keep the jewel deserters out for pretty close to six months, sometimes four four months, but my carpet chameleons and Jackson's chameleons and lesser chameleons, they'll be out for three months out of the year, you know? And that's not, that's not all year, but like a a quarter of their lives gets to be spent outside in the natural sun and the natural rain and the natural wind. And man, the, the, the vigor of the animals, it just skyrockets when they're out there. Like the, just the skin texture of a carpet chameleon that's been outdoors for three months versus the skin texture of a a healthy carpet chameleon that's been kept indoors for nine months is different. And like, it'll be carpet community. They'll get dropped to 40 degrees at night. When I keep them outside, they wake up the next morning and they're eating and they're drinking. It's normal. Right. So, so number one, take advantage of that window, right? It's totally worth it for your animals. Um, Number two, just research where your animal comes from. Spend a lot of time digging through weather data from where these animals come from. And so that you're making sure that you're keeping them within that range, right? You don't want to keep them, you know, don't keep them outside when it's 50 degrees, when the animal comes from the Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful, make sure you're keeping the animal in natural weather conditions. Uh, But also as long as you're keeping them within the, the relative temperatures that they would experience in the wild, you know, they're, they're hardy animals. Like they're not meant, they're, they're not, delicate animals, especially when they're kept in natural conditions, their hardiness seems to increase even. Um, so just number one, pay attention to their, their local climate. Um, and then also be aware of micro habitats. Think about where your animal lives in its natural habitat, just because it's 80 degrees, um, in Madagascar in that day, doesn't mean that the animal is living in an 80 degree exposed patch of sun. Right. There's a big difference between shade and sun and uh, undergrowth versus, you know, the canopy and, and so on. So just be mindful of what niche, what microhabitat your animal comes from and just try to replicate that as much as possible. Air on the side of safety. So there are times in the summer here in Pennsylvania, it'll be 80 degrees during the day. And then a storm front will blow through and we'll have a hailstorm. So you have to be prepared, uh, have contingencies in place. I'll pull my screen enclosures inside that my carpets are in. Or if I have blue tongues or jeweled lacertas outside, I'll pull tarps over their enclosures. If there's a major like deluge or, or a hailstorm, things like that. So, you know, pay attention to where they naturally occur and have contingencies in place in case of extreme weather. Mm. Yeah, those are some great tips. I think it's something I would love to do at some point in the future, even if it's just for July and August, that's probably all I'd be able to squeeze out, but it's totally worth it. Like you said, it and will I've said be. on the podcast yeah. before, a small enclosure outside is a massive enclosure inside. I mean, when you have a backyard, it, you can have something that looks relatively small, but it would take up your, like, you know, half your living yeah, room or something because you just absolutely. have so much more space to work with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My, my jeweled Lacerda outdoor enclosures are bigger than my indoor Lacerda enclosures. Of course they are. It's e- it's easy to do. I have a big yard. So yeah, it's, it's, it's totally worth it. I think in the behaviors um, and the, the vigor that you'll see from your reptiles just from two months outdoors, uh, 
yeah, you'll be sold, I think, after one summer. Yeah, no, I, I think I definitely am going to do it. Well, why don't we wrap up talking about the YouTube channel just really quick. You can let sure. people know uh, what, you, what you have on the channel. You have some great videos, and it sounds like you're getting ramping up to, to start producing some more content at some point. I know you took a little bit of a break, but you're, yeah. you're back at it. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I have no aspirations of being a YouTuber or a pet tuber or anything like that. My goal is education. And just like with how I keep my animals, there, there's two reasons for that. Like one is altruistic. I want to educate people. I want to help people succeed, um, especially with the animals that I'm selling them. I want them to be successful both for their enjoyment and for the health of the animals. But then on the other side, that is on the selfish side, the reason why I have the YouTube channel and also the reason why I write articles is so that when somebody asks me a question, I can give them a link and mm -hmm. say here... And it'll be that link will be way better than I could possibly respond to typing on my keyboard, right? And here I'm showing them. So like it's like uploading, front loading the work. Like it takes a lot of work to make these YouTube videos, but then I, then it's always there. So my goal is to have um, as many care videos as possible for the animals that I work with and for the animals that I breed and sell. So that that way I can give that to every person that gets an animal and say, this is how I do it. Um, and hopefully that will help them to be successful. Yeah, you know, it's a it's a great model. And I think that's one of the things that we have in the hobby is sometimes the breeders are not educating the the buyers as well as they could be. And yeah. to have a channel that you just, you know, associate, here's the link, here's how you can replicate what I'm doing here. This is how I've had mm -hmm. success. Plus, like you mentioned at the beginning, you have experience working with many iterations of the same species. It's not like you have one animal and then you get a career, you know, had a care guide off of that single experience. You have like yeah. you know, tens of tens of animals of the same species. And then it's a really holistic guide. Yeah, exactly. And that's what I'm trying to provide. And, and then also because of the fact that I believe in progressive care, like my William side video, like I'll probably change and, and do an updated one soon. I definitely going to do updated carpet chameleon ones. So like, as I learn personally and progress, I can add that to the channel and add that to the library. So that it'll be always available. So yeah, I definitely plan to keep doing more um, with that. Um, so yeah, that's living art by Frank Payne is where people can find me on, you know, on YouTube, on Instagram, on Facebook, um, my, my website as well. Same name. Awesome. And you do have some beautiful species and even the, looking at the pictures is great. So Thanks. is there anything else you wanted to say before we officially wrapped up? I think we've covered uh, almost everything. Yeah, that's a lot. Um, I think I really enjoyed our discussion. Uh, you know, I could talk about reptiles all day long. I know we both have lives and have things to do, so we've got to cut it. Uh, but yeah, I'm happy to have this conversation. And if people have questions for me they're you know they're more than welcome to reach out to me on youtube on facebook on instagram so i'm happy to help as much as i can uh and i really uh, appreciate you having me on i really enjoy your show uh i think it's you know one of the most high level um avenues for discussion and for education out there so uh, i feel very honored to be on well, it was an absolute pleasure having you on, and I think we'll definitely have to have you back on at some point again in the future because, like you said, you could probably talk for hours, so there's probably for more sure. episodes in that brain. So thank Sounds you so great. much, Frank. This was this was a blast. Absolutely. Thanks, Tom. All right, that is the end of that episode. Frank, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. As I said at the end, we're definitely going to have to do another couple episodes. I think there's so much more we can talk about and there's a few other projects that you're working on as well that we can definitely talk about. So we will revisit that in the future. But for now, thank you so much for sharing all your wisdom and knowledge with us. That was absolutely fantastic. Listeners, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed the episode, make sure you let me know. You can send me a message on Instagram. That's at animals at home CA or put it in the comments on the YouTube uh, section as well. YouTube has really actually started to pump the podcast for the first time. The algorithm has picked up a few episodes, actually quite a few episodes. So so the channel is growing. There's lots of new subscribers. So thank you to everybody who is supporting it. It's it's really incredible. It's kind of funny. Once the baby was born, I stopped posting as, regu as, as regularly as I normally do. And suddenly the YouTube algorithm picks it up and starts promoting it. Who knows how that works, but for whatever reason, it started to promote it. So I'm not going to complain. So if you're one of the new subscribers, thank you so much. And again, just commenting on the channel does does really help. If you're looking for more information on this episode, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. You'll find all the show notes for every episode that has been recorded, as well as the other shows that are also on the Animals at Home Network. If you would like to join us over at Patreon, you can support the show for as little as $3 a month. You'll have access to the Discord server at that level. And again, that will help me afford 
outsourcing the editing, which I'm very close to doing. So we're going to do that probably in the next couple of weeks. So if you want to help support the show that way, that's a great way to do that. And thank you so much to customreptilehabitats.com. The affiliate link is in both the YouTube description and the show notes, but you can also just type in on your browser animalsathome.ca slash CRH. That will take you right to Custom Reptile Habitat's website. And you can, if you do pick up an enclosure through that link, a small commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you. And I think that is it for this episode. Again, I think next week is the episode I'm going to try to outsource editing on. So we'll see how that goes. And other than that, I will catch everybody on the next episode.